A trilogy of messages as we've started the year, uh, just to try and understand what the Lord is doing amongst us. We sense together that we are entering a new chapter as a church. Like the turning of 2024 is also a turning of a page for us as a church. And there is a new season that we sense we're, we're walking into. And the last three, this, this will be the third of three messages, has really been us trying to grapple with what does it look like to move into a new chapter with God? And what are some of the dynamics of that so in the first week we we looked at how we sense we're part of we know we're part of this this river of God the spirit of God and we sense it rising amongst us and we looked at how in our hearts we need to respond there are some things in our hearts that we need to do if we're going to respond to what God is doing as he pours out his Holy Spirit last week we looked at a kind of a broad level of the dynamics of breakthrough what should we expect and one of the key things if we're going to expect breakthrough in the kingdom of God is we have to expect some wilderness experiences before breakthrough it's always wilderness and then breakthrough it's cross then resurrection it's suffering and then glory this is the way of Jesus Christ and today what I want to do is just close out these three messages and take a closer look at what happened in the wilderness because in moments where chapters are changing in our individual lives and as a church with God's people Whenever there is a moment of breakthrough coming, you can be sure that the devil is going to come close and try and derail you and derail us. I don't have time today to argue for the existence of the devil. If you're not a Christian here today, we're so glad that you're here. You might think, whoa, what on earth am I going to be in for today if you've got questions please talk to someone myself your neighbor we'd love just to help you i'm going to assume the existence of a personal evil being if we believe that there is a personal good being who is all powerful and if we look around at the evidence of the world i don't think it's too far of a step to actually conclude there is also an evil being behind the scenes trying to orchestrate and derail and sometimes destroy lives what I want to do is look at really two things. I want, to under, I want us to understand Satan and his ways. And then I want to understand Jesus. Both are very important. Understanding Jesus is infinitely more important. But as we're going to see, understanding the ways of Jesus, understanding the ways of Satan actually can help us get smart in our walk with Jesus. Is that all right? But what happens when we're looking at breakthrough in next chapters in our life? You can trust that Satan comes close. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he says this, that we shouldn't be um, outwitted by Satan, but we should understand how he works. He spoke to the church in, in, in Corinth in chapter 2, and he says this, for we, not, we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Paul seems to think that it's important to know how Satan works so that we wouldn't be confused or uncertain as to when things happen in our life, actually what's going on. And oftentimes we attribute things to ourselves that are actually satanic in origin. It's a bit like if you play team sports um, or any kind of sports competitively, you will often take time to study the opponent, right? If you're playing, a manager might get your, the team together, they're playing football match, just to watch some of the tapes on how the other team play. What are their strengths? Where are they weak? Hey, these guys down the side are fast. Those guys in the middle are big. We need to orient. We, and what we have in this snapshot is, is basically like a video tape of how Satan likes to work in trying to derail us. And it's a sensible thing for us to do just to watch and understand the ways of Satan so that when our lives often become difficult and there are things in our hearts and minds that get tricky, we can see what's happening in the plays that are being made. There are not many new plays that Satan makes. So we can see, understand and learn and actually know from Christ into our own lives. So that's that's what we're going to do. The first thing that we, that we learn in this moment and at a top level is that Satan will always, almost always come to us in the areas of our calling. He will almost always try and tempt us in the areas where God has asked us to be. With the things that we're actually good at, with the things that are within our power to do. The things that are in our lane, 
the things that make us tick these are normally the areas where satan likes to come because we see here christ has just been commissioned by the father he's just been baptized he is just about to be turning this new chapter into a ministry chapter moving from carpentry turning taking moving career into this ministry of preaching healing seeing the kingdom of god advance and it's in this moment in this moment of calling that satan comes in very close and tries to derail him here satan does not normally come in the areas of your life that you're not that interested in he comes in the areas that are most precious to you even where god has called you that's where he wants to derail you because he knows if he can derail you there then he can separate you and bring about a destruction and he has these three temptations that he works with our calling individually and as a church the first temptation is this he loves to tempt us to serve our own needs and our own selves first look what he says in verse 3 he says he comes to jesus and the tempter came and said to him if you are the son of god command these stones to become loaves of bread now there's nothing wrong with making loaves of bread right there's nothing better often than like hot crusty bread with salty butter it's, it, this is like a god-given gift we know it's not a wrong thing because later in the gospels jesus does this like many times over this is not something that he's forbidden to do so what is wrong with jesus in this moment making bread i want to suggest three things and three temptations that we face the first thing is it was too soon this wasn't the moment for jesus to be making bread this was a wilderness and testing moment there was a moment to come where the crowds were when the needs were there that was the moment to make bread and to serve and provide for other people this was not the moment it was too soon and sometimes we can be impatient can't we when we receive prophetic word we have a sense of calling there is a thing of destiny we sense that this is what's coming for us and what can happen is we can try and grab at that before it's the timing of god we find it very hard to be patient but we trust god so the first thing is it was just too soon the second thing that we find here is that that is actually just for himself Jesus had the power to make bread, but that power to, was to be used to serve other people. He, Jesus came, he knew, the resolve in his heart was, I have come not to be served, but to serve. This is why I'm coming to give away, to give to other people. Which is why when there were crowds there and there was need there, it was the moment to make bread and to multiply bread again and again and again and again to serve the needs of those people around him but here we have jesus taking what he can do within his orbit and he makes bread for himself and it's interesting that it's not a bad thing is it like it, it's just food that's how god made us and how close satan wants to get to the good things in our lives and just just like by a point one of a degree twist it so it becomes for us I mean, if i were with jesus i'd be like jesus like you're hungry god has made us to eat you can do it you should you should just make the bread look after yourself everything in me would be wanting to look looking after jesus and i don't understand why but he knows this is the moment and it is not the moment to make the bread for himself and the last thing i think that the, the problem with this moment is that it would have been in the flesh for jesus he walked with the father every step of the way but this was not the moment this was a moment of testing this was a moment of wilderness this was the, t the, the time of retreat so he could be with the father in preparation for this breakthrough this wasn't the moment for him and if he had done this he would have snatched at it in the flesh have you ever done something with an uneasy conscience ever done something with an uneasy conscience you're like this is all like from the externals this is all fine but there is just something in my conscience and i know if i went for that that would not be with the father looking on i would want to be trying to hide and snatch at it in the flesh i think this is what jesus is being tested with and he will take the good things in our lives and the good things that are going on in church and he will tempt us to make bread for ourselves 
In fact, it was one of the discussions we had when we were talking about the special offering. It was like, we, don't, we could at this point say, let's take up a special offering to make things kind of even nicer for us as a church. And there's nothing bad with that. I mean, Hilly was saying this morning, we need some things. Like that thing has been held apart, held together with like duct tape at the moment. So we do need to get some like new music stands and stuff like this. But it would be tempting to say, hey, we're at this point now, let's make more bread for ourselves to make church just a bit nicer for us. We know that temptation. Where are you tempted to make bread for yourself? I've been reflecting on this this week and thinking like for us we we have so much ability to do things we like we have resources we can travel most of us have got big friendship networks we can call upon we've got f- family we work we have so much freedom and so much ability to be able to to do stuff and i was thinking how how wide is the field of temptation that satan has with people generally like our church with resources and jobs and opportunities and the world is our oyster and you think gosh the playing field is large right talk to talk to some christians who have nothing who are in persecution in war zones like they're fit like it's limited like what what can they actually do but for us all the areas say to be saying make bread for yourself it's a temptation isn't it even in our calling ah, do it for me that's the first thing the second thing is the desire to be noticed you're looking at all me a little bit glum i didn't say it was going to be fun it's going to be truthful but Let me read this in verse um, seven, verse eight. Again, the devil, the tempter, took him to a very high mountain and showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. So you've got to imagine Jerusalem with the temple in the middle and Jerusalem, which was a smallish city in the, in the moment, big for the moment, but small for us, with the temple that stood head and shoulders above every other building so that if Jesus were taken to the top of the temple, he would have been seen right across the temple, right across the city, outside of the city walls so that all of the outskirts of Jerusalem would see Jesus on the pinnacle of the temple. And Satan tempts him and says, why don't you climb to the top with me and jump down? Because there are Bible verses that says that angels will come and swoop up and and rescue you. You notice how Satan takes truthful things, Bible verses, and uses them to try and lead us astray. Now, Jesus, we're told, was a man who had nothing spectacular about him in the flesh. Isaiah 53 says there was nothing about his form that was special or had any kind of majesty. In fact, we're told he was despised. He could be in this room and you wouldn't know in the flesh. He was ordinary. And so I wonder whether there was this temptation in Jesus known that he was the son of god for all eternity in the past he has been the king of glory on the throne devoted on by the father and then he comes down to earth and he lives and everyone just walks past him as someone who is unspectacular like the temptation to say do you know who i actually am anyone have those moments where you're like you're just busting to tell them something like really great about your life in conversation in a dinner party or over coffee like ask me about this thing because i really want to tell you about you know like do you know who i am and so saying tempt him says you could be spectacular imagine the kind of viral video if you threw yourself off and angels caught you that would get attention across jerusalem then you would get noticed and i think this is massive for us in a culture that is continually shouting at us to get attention get noticed like isn't the fabric of everything that we're about today about 
getting noticed right like on social media everything is about like getting your likes are you liked you in the workplace get yourself noticed how to stand apart from the colleague you know everything is like how do you get yourself known and noticed i th i thought i'd i'd killed this in my life because you know i i took the step a few years ago i mean it wasn't difficult because i wasn't using much social media but i thought do you know what every time i post something on instagram i'm there checking every 42 seconds to see if anyone's liked it and i just i couldn't deal with like what it was doing on my heart so anyway uh, i stopped that and then i started running and so you got strava right any strava users out there all right thanks okay <laughs> I am one of those annoying running evangelists, as I'll come on to in a minute. Anyway, and so like, I've, I've realized even now, you know, there I am, I changing the world of running, you know, across uh, the trails and roads of London, and I've uploaded it to Strava, and there I am again. Like, I'm, who's gonna give me kudos for this run? And normally, uh, my average is about two, two people. One of them's Toria, and uh, <laughs> often Aaron is the other person, so thanks, mate. Um, and I'm like, I can feel it. I'm like, I mean, it's just running. I'm just doing it because I love it. And yet I'm still like, why isn't no one noticing how well I'm doing? Like, I've not they seen my pace. That was a really long run. It's in our heart to be noticed, isn't it? Like we want people to validate us. Our hearts can live in two directions. And the first direction that our heart can live in and needs to if we're going to live with a full heart is directed towards the father our heart can keep our eyes on the father and if 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 the eyes of our heart are on our father in heaven we have an infinite being who loves us beyond measure overflowingly loves us and if our hearts are directed towards him then we will always have this cascading overflowing love that is filling up our heart so that we live with this kind of fullness so whether you get noticed at work or whether you don't get noticed at work if your eyes are always looking to the father in heaven you don't need to be noticed because you're already full and the eyes of the one who will judge you are already on you and so you don't need to look around for other people to validate you and yet what satan does is he takes jesus whose eyes were always directed to his father and he says why don't you look around at jerusalem and the world for a moment just have a look and why why don't you get their approval instead of your father's approval and what happens is if you take your eyes off your father in heaven who will fill your heart up and if you start looking around to those around you your colleagues those, those who are following you on social media if you start looking to them for your likes and to be noticed you will always suffer with an empty heart because finite beings creatures like you cannot fill up your heart with what you are made for which is god and you will always in some sense be on the periphery of the other person's life they can't give you the kind of attention that your heart so desperately craves and what will happen if we take our eyes away from the father to try and get noticed by the world is that we will stop loving the world and start simply using the world to fill up what is empty in our own heart <laughs> It's what Satan does, just tempts us to, it's happening all the time. I would imagine even as we leave Sunday, we're lift, lifting our eyes to the Father, we see he loves me, I'm his beloved. And then what happens is slowly our eyes start just drifting downwards and we start looking again at colleagues and neighbours and social media accounts and things and think, well, why? <laughs> what good is it if the creator of the world loves me if I'm only getting three likes on Strava, you know? No, I'm full. My heart is full. <laughs> don't worry. I don't, I don't mind heckling. Um, I, I sometimes talk with Christians and the, there is a conversation that often seems to happen where pe Christians say, like, with a good heart, that I, I want to do more for God. Like, I, I, I want to have a calling in God. I want to I wanna do more for him. And my immediate reaction is, is often, like, I mean, I look at the life oftentimes and I think, I don't, I don't get it because 
you're working a full job, it's exhausting you, you're loving your spouse, if you're married, you've got kids, you're, you're loving your kids, I can see the way that you're looking after neighbours, you're engaged in church and, and, and serving the church, like you're, like you're doing the stuff. Like, I, what do you mean you want to do more for God? You are loving God with all that you have right here and right now. And over the years, I, I've come to this conclusion, and I could be wrong, but I, I wonder, there you go, I'm going to say it in a nice English way. <laughs> I wonder if whether sometimes that desire in us to do more for God is not actually that we want to be doing more for God, it's that we want to be more noticed for what we're doing for God. Because we're doing it. <laughs> We're turning up at work. We're loving our colleagues. We're loving our family. We're serving in church. This is the calling to love God where he has put us. And so if we're feeling this, I'm not doing enough for God. Let me ask you, is it actually a desire not to do more for him, but actually just to be noticed in this life for what we're doing? I say that because I've searched my own heart who has had to wrestle with this. Actually, do I, is it just because I like being noticed? <laughs> I like the attention. And Satan will do that and he'll take us away from the Father. And he'll say, look at these, you're lacking, aren't you? There's more, because there's, there's always more then, right? There's always more people who could like you and follow you and et cetera, et cetera. I've got to move on. Thirdly, Satan tempts Jesus with an easier path. He says this, the final of the three temptations. He says in verse... Um, uh, eight. Uh, yeah, the I think I've got all of this right. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, sorry, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. So just get this. Satan is offering Jesus that all of creation will worship him. But as Richard's already told us, this is going to happen. So again, he takes us a truth and he just twists it. He says something that is going to happen, Revelation, we're told one day all of creation is going to bow down and worship Jesus. Satan comes and says, there is an easier path that I can offer to you. Like a salesman saying, there's a better, easier way. Let me show you this three-step plan that doesn't involve the cross. Just bow down to me and I'll give it all to you right now. It's a one-time deal. You can imagine the temptation. Jesus knowing what was going to ensue because of the cross. Satan says, no, you, you can just move that aside and you can take an easier path. How, how often do we want the easier path? Eh? How often do we want it? There's, there's a difficult path and there's an easy path. I'm like, I'll take the easy path, thanks. And yet Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me. This is the way to glory. Amen. And it's easy for us as a church as well to think, pick an easy course. And it feels like the, the heat around Christians and the church is intensifying. It is. I mean, you don't have to feel it. It is intensifying in the West. Say this or say that. Yeah. crucified either way and so what would be the temptation for us as a church I tell you what I feel sometimes the temptation would be to cut an easier path through the next few decades and actually if we didn't say these things about the Bible and if we didn't read those passages that were in the Bible and if we tried to smooth the path by just picking out the comfortable pieces of the Bible then actually may, may, maybe we'll find a way through that will be less of an aggravation in our kind of society that would be a, a temptation for us that would creep in and yeah I think for us the calling isn't it is to follow the way of Christ to teach the scriptures all of the scriptures the whole counsel of God come what may follow Christ in faithfulness Peter later he went to Jesus I mean in good heart I, you, you have to love Peter because you know, <laughs> he got so much wrong he, he, he's a kind of guy you know that thinks second speaks first like and but loves God 
you know, like if he makes a mistake, it's, it's a big mistake and it's public, but he does love God. This is Jesus, because Jesus says, I have to suffer. He, tell, he, he tells us, I have to suffer. And Peter would tell this in Matthew 16, I mean, took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. I mean, like the kind of like, <laughs> I mean, lack of self-awareness and social, like, this is Jesus who is plotting the salvation of the world. And Peter's like, brother, I've got a better way for you. You can't, you know, you can't do this. You're Jesus Christ. You're going to take on the world. You can't be crucified. And he rebukes him. Uh, but, but Jesus says to him, far be it, sorry, G Peter says, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you that you'll suffer. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Be careful to counsel people too quickly when they talk about their sense of calling and the direction of their life. Because you don't know what God is doing with them. I know everything in me sometimes, I hear what people are doing, I'm like, oh. I, I feel the need sometimes to put the brakes on. You know, having taken some silly choices in our life, silly in God, I hope. You know, now I look and look at other people, I'm like, ah, oh, I every now I take the safe option. You know, like whatever it is, like do the thing because I, I feel the thing. But sometimes maybe they're following Christ and what looks like foolishness to the world is their faith and their trust in God. And there is going to be a road marked with suffering for them. But that is the way for them and the path to glory. So let us be careful how we counsel one another and let us not always just pick each other up onto the easy path. Does that make sense? Okay, good. That's, that's some of how Satan likes to tempt us. Let, let, let me encourage us with Jesus. That's how the enemy works. That's the videotape of the opposition. But how do we face him? And I think sometimes we, we can misunderstand spiritual war warfare like it's us versus the devil. Like, if you're a Christian, you kind of like, okay, you've got Bible verses. What did Jesus do? He had Bible verses. So I've got to get my Bible verses together. And you kind of go toe to toe with the devil. Like, you're in the boxing ring. There's Satan. There's you. Like, okay, you throw your mistruth. I'll give you my Bible verse. Bang. Counter punch. Bang. Counter punch. Bang. But that's, that, that's not how we're called to fight and walk into new seasons as Christians. Because Jesus, he takes us, he takes us out of the ring. And Jesus steps into the ring with Satan himself. And as we learned last week, watching Jesus with Satan is not a, a, a lesson in how to. It's actually watching Jesus be the victor on our behalf. It's watching Jesus win a fight with Satan on our behalf. So Jesus, he tucks us to one side, and we're not even his corner man. He tucks us to one side so that we can watch. And so when Christ, he wins a victory for us against the tempter, and when his arms are raised by the Father, he ushers us up at the last bell, and he asks us to come and stand on the canvas with him, so that we become a victor with Christ. We win in these moments, not through braving it with our Bible verses, but through knowing who we are in Jesus Christ. Amen? Yes. This is how we win. It's Christ who wins. And we need to understand who we are in him, therefore. Because it's interesting in this moment, Satan came directly for Jesus' identity. Do you notice he has this moment where he's in the baptismal waters, he comes out of the water, being baptized by John, his cousin, and this word comes over him, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. He's just been declared publicly. The favour of God is on him. The smile of his father has been declared to everyone around him. And how does Satan come to him? He says, if, if you are what your father has just said, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, if, if you are a child of God, this is how he comes to us at our identity. Let me just explain this. Who, who has read James Clear's book, Atomic Habits? Anyone? Like, yeah, yeah there, there's, a, there's a kind of certain type of person who likes this kind of book. And I have finally got around to it. You've probably seen it. But anyway, it's, it's a really helpful book. And he talks about kind of basically developing habits and how you can kind of reach goals. Um, and he has this take at the beginning. I think it's profound. 
He says you can basically approach life from two perspectives. You can either approach it from an outcome based approach, like a goal based approach, which is, you know, I want to run 5K or I want to get thinner. Or if you're a Christian, I want to have a great prayer life or I really want to know the Bible deeply. That's a goal. And he says many of us live with just goals. I just, I just have the goal and I hope one day I'm going to reach it. That's one way that we approach life. We we'll just have this list of things that we hope to achieve one day. But the other way of looking at things is to have an identity based approach to life, which says this is who I am. And therefore, because this is who I am, this is how I behave. And so he talks about running as an example. I'm sorry to bore you, but just bear with me for a minute. He talks about running, someone who doesn't run, but they want to be a runner. And someone asked them, what are you doing? He said, I'm starting to do some runs. And he says, there is a difference between someone who says, I am trying to run a 5K. And someone who says, I am a runner. And I run. One day I'll get to run 5K. Does that make sense? One person says, I'm not a good runner. I've never run in my life and I'm, I'm just trying to do a couch stuff. And the other person identifies as a runner. And because of that identity, out of that place flows process and doing and multiple runs that be, go way beyond just a, a goal. He says this in his book. He says, true behavior change is identity change. You might start a habit because of motivation, but the only reason you'll stick with one is that it becomes part of your identity. The reason that you'll carry on going is this is just who I am. And so Jesus says this in John 8, 44 about Satan who speaks out of his identity. He says when Jesus, when Satan, sorry, lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. So why does Satan always come tempting you? Because that's his identity. He is the tempter. So he acts out of his behavior. And Jesus tells us, doesn't he, like, good trees produce good fruit, bad trees produce bad fruit. Look after your own heart, because out of your heart, our behaviors flow inwards to outwards, not outwards to inwards. And so if you overlap this onto Christianity, you might say, well, I want to have a, a better prayer life. Well, then you don't just have that as a goal. You then change your identity to someone who prays and out of that place will flow prayer. And here is the point where James Clear separates from Jesus Christ, who both happen to be JC. But I just it just occurred to me this morning. But anyway, this is where they because the book's good and I, it's really helpful. But what but what James Clear talks about is not gospel. Because he says what you need to do is you need to choose the identity that you want and then prove that identity to yourself with small wins. So running. I want to be a runner. OK, well, choose that identity now and then add up an accumulation of runs to prove to yourself that your identity is true. So we're creating our own identity out of our own works and forming an identity for us. And you quickly see how the gospel works in a radically different way. That in Jesus Christ, we don't choose our identity and have to work for it. We are gifted an identity in Jesus Christ, not based on small wins that we make with the devil, but based on the great win that Jesus Christ made when he faced him on the cross and was victorious once and for all, for all who would trust in him. Our identity is in Jesus Christ and is given to us not on a means-tested basis, on my life. The Father's eyes aren't on my life, testing my life, but are on Christ's life, and he is victorious. And as he walks to the cross, and as we see him in the wilderness, and we face his temptation, as he walks flawlessly and perfectly with the Father, we are gifted Jesus Christ's identity. And what is his identity? You are my son with whom I am well pleased. You are my beloved daughter, with whom I am well pleased. This is how the gospel works. We don't choose an identity and then prove it to ourselves. We are gifted an identity by the Father in Jesus Christ. So when Jesus Christ comes and he has these words spoken over him, he then lives and this identity is proven once again and again and again 
tempted, tempted, tempted to walk away from his identity. But he acts in accordance with his identity as the beloved son of God. With a full heart, he loves everybody and he never uses anybody. He doesn't need to be noticed because he's noticed by his father. His identity is secure. And he walks a path of suffering and he never chooses the easy path because he knows the pleasure of God is better than all the pleasures of this world. And when he goes to the cross, he is choosing in that moment to take what is his, his identity as a beloved one of God, and gift it to all who would trust in him. This is the gospel, a simple thank you for what he has done. So how do we face temptation and moments of breakthrough? It is not us getting strong in ourselves, but us understanding what we've been given in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are more loved than you know right now. You are more loved than your emotions would tell you. Far more loved. You might be thinking in your heart, well, I, I don't take that for myself because you know your track record. I don't take that. It's not proven on the basis of your small wins. Yeah, it's both on the basis of Christ's great victory. And if you are a gospel believer, a Jesus follower, it's given to you. And so the way we're going to walk into a new chapter with God as a church is by diving headfirst into the waterfall of God's overflowing love over us. And it is to believe the word of the Father that says, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. You are my beloved daughter with whom I am well pleased more than the temptations of the enemy.